hairy back, hairy bush, the chest hair is just getting out of control. And I always would have kept it trimmed up where the head and the hair is just getting thinner by the day. So I'm not piggybacking this. I'm telling you now, I'm the same. And the light is great. I've grown out slightly. I've not used Manscaped on me head. I've got hairs growing out my traps and my legs are hairier than they've ever been. Maybe because I was, you know, I was taking 500 collisions a day in contact with rugby, but I've got no hair. I have no hair on my legs. Now I'm like a gorilla. <laughs> I mean, I'm the same. Like, you know, look at these hairs here, like this length, I could coming out everywhere. So me and I, I'm in very much of need, need a manscaped uh, trimmer to get me trimmed up, looking good for the summer. When we had IP, the Andy Rose uh, stag do, we'll be there. I'll send you the weed whacker. Um, Stevie, some big news, mate. CJ Sander, he's hanging up the slippers. Did you see that come in? Um, no, Jim, I didn't. Um, especially like, you know, there was a lot of chat on, on your pod and a few other media sources about you know, potentially going to France. Uh, there was those rumours floating around. Reading uh, the statement that he released, he said it was one frosty, freezing cold morning in Limerick where he, he kind of realised that, uh, you know, it was maybe time to move on. But I, I never expected him to retire, even to go back to South Africa and maybe play for a franchise or a team over there. Would have been what I thought he would have done because he's got lots in the tank. He's really durable. He's shown that he, he he's a consistent performer, but I, I think he's he's very much family first. And with having his first kid there not so long ago, I think it's uh, it's maybe to read between the lines, Jim. It's it's maybe uh, taking his focus away from rugby ever so slightly, and he, he needs to get a, give a bit more time back to his family. Uh, so yeah. that's one of the reasons for sure. Is he out of contract or not? Or is he in contract yep. still? No, he. I think he's out of contract with the RFU at the end of this year because he was certainly one of those players that was being talked about, like Johnny Sexton, uh, like Ty Furlong. Um, you know that uh, they're on the national contracts, and I, I, he was on a national contract, and it was definitely up this summer. Even at that, Jim, like you know, he went on the last Lions tour. For him to take himself out of that picture as well, um, considering like he's, he's probably, you know, at six or seven back rowers that might go on the tour, he's there or thereabouts. So, uh, yeah, it's a huge decision. What's your thoughts like? I was shocked. I, I, I think he's actually been playing really well this last season. I know he had a little bit of a dip in form, but I, I'm shocked by it, really. And I didn't know whether he was in contract still, similar to Marcel Kutsir at Ulster, was homesick and was thinking, actually, I might take a year off or whatever, not see out my contract, go home with the son, and then maybe, you know, play again. He might do that as well. He might get home. He might get the son on his back in South Africa. Uh, but, you know, I'm a big fan of CJ Stander. I like the way that he plays. Playing against him, I touched him once. And uh, I think he's been great for Irish rugby. You know, you, you think about these project players, you might think a little bit different. But uh, from a Scotland perspective, the project players, that we, you know, across the board have been pretty good. From Ireland, you've got a bigger pool of players. How do you think CJ Stander will be received, having been a guy that couldn't even speak English, Irish, uh, when he turned up in the country, to kind of how he's perceived now? Yeah, definitely, Jim. And of course, you're going to have a lot of people um, saying about you know that you'd rather pick homegrown talent uh, over bringing in foreigners. But every team is is able to bring in a foreigner, or a couple of foreigners, and a project player along the way. And CJ Standers come in, and you know, he's the type of player that's dedicated his his whole life over the last number of years to Irish rugby and to Munster rugby. And you can't take that away from somebody like you know you got to. Um, you got to commend people like him who give absolutely everything. Um, you know, goes out of his way, learns the national anthem, plays with his heart uh, on a sleeve, week in week out. And yeah, all accounts, he's a really decent fella as well. So yeah, I think all the Irish fans will look at him with fond memories come the end of June or whenever he's going to hang up the boots officially uh, and thank him, Jim, for what he's given the Irish rugby. He's played the British and Irish Lions uh, tour as well in 2017. So, yeah, he's been a great player for Ireland. But again, him stepping aside opens the door for, for other players now. And the likes of Jack Conan to come through. Will Max Deegan at Leinster get himself fit? Um, you know, young Gavin Coombs. Yeah, young Gavin Coombs. You have Doris there also. So uh, I think those lads will be, <laughs> they'll be happy enough that he's hanging up the boots. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, we wish CJ Stander well. Um, you know, hopefully he might still make the Lions tour. There might be something that could be done around his contract. 
Right, we move forward, looking at this island squad as a whole. Like, what do you make of the Six Nations? Uh, obviously, didn't start very well. They had a good win against Italy. The win against Scotland was massive. We were favourites. Scotland were favourites going into that game, you know, having lost nine out of ten games against Ireland or some ridiculous stat like that. Um, but what do you make of Ireland? Forget Scotland. What do you make of Ireland so far? See, it's funny you say that, like, but they weren't actually favourites with the bookmakers. So, you know, all these Scottish fans and everybody in World Rugby was thinking that Scotland were the favourites because of that brilliant performance they had against England. And, you know, they had, a, you know, four or five purple patches in that game that um, we all thought they were going to kick on. And then in the first half against Wales, they played brilliantly again. And then they sort of, and I've said this a few times about Scotland, they're, they're a team that has shown over the last decade they, they, they just can't get it done. And when they get themselves in a good position, they can't get it done. So when it went to 24-all against Ireland, you're always back in Ireland to get it done rather than Scotland. And, you know, I think on the bookies, just to go back to that, it was only one or two points in the game, but Ireland were actually favourites to get into that. They won the last out of the nine, ten games. I think it's two and 16 or two and 17 that Scotland have actually now won. Like the stats are crazily, crazy stacked against Scotland there. Um, but in terms of Ireland, Jim, you gotta um, you gotta say that they played reasonably well. But yes, for me, they're, they're kicking the ball far too much. Um, I'd like to see a lot more attack and play. Scotland had a few more line breaks than Ireland, but let's face it, both teams tried to kick the ball and force the opposition to make mistakes. And um, you know, Ireland had Johnny Sexton who played really well. Ben Russell went off obviously with an HIA, didn't finish the game, and uh, they lost a little bit bit of control in that second half. But yeah, Ireland. A little bit unlucky in the first game, for sure. Of course, you know, with the red card, it's obviously going to have a, a huge impact on the end results when you're having to play for 14 men for that long. But the bounce back reasonably well. I still think there's huge improvement. And are they a top two, three team in the world right now? I don't think they are. Um, and I think the, the game between England and France, you know, England showed a lot more pedigree than they have done. Um, and France, you know, showing what they're all about. So for me, Ireland are still playing a, a little bit of catch up, Jim. But at the same time, uh, getting results in test matches is is always what it's about, isn't it? No, absolutely. It was a couple of things from the Scotland game that kind of I want to chat about, but kind of set the wider narrative around this Irish team. So six lineouts lost to uh, Scotland lost. It could have been seven. Um, the Paul O'Connell effect. And you don't want to jump on the piggyback, uh, the, all the media and stuff and say, oh, Paul O'Connell was coming and made a big difference. I actually spoke to him last week on the phone. <laughs> he rang me. Um <laughs> Just about something, it was about whiskey. We were chatting about whiskey, but um, we start, start, started talking about lineouts. I said, Paulie, when I played against the Island, mate, I used to just stand up for the lineout screaming, and you'd be, you'd have this calculated kind of plan of, of, of how you're going to play against us. But he's come into the Irish squad. Um, I know Andy Farrell was probably trying to get him in uh, before he, he joined, the, joined the camp. And you well, can it's see. Funny the, it's funny you say that, though, Jim. So, rumor has it here on the island of Ireland that. Andy Farrell wasn't the one that got him in, that it was David Nisifora who you know, overlooks the whole rugby pitcher here in Ireland, that it was, um, it was, it just wasn't Andy Farrell. I think there was a few other people that were trying to get Paul in there to, to help with the set piece. Um, now that's, that's what I've heard. That's only my opinion on it. That's what I've heard. But I think Andy Farrell now is, uh, is glad of having a man of, of his stature and his ability and his, his coaching um, what he's all about in the ranks because it, the, the Irish lineup has been superb, specifically on the defensive side of things. And you know yourself, Jim, that's all down to homework. Like it's all down to hours spent on the laptop. I know I'm regurgitating a lot of stuff that's been said in the media over the last number of weeks. But Paulie, from a personal level, I, I know him reasonably well. I've played with him for a, a good number of years. He is one of the best blokes, a top, top fella, really genuine guy. But by God, he works his bollocks off. Like, he works so, so hard. And he will give everything to that Irish team um, to make sure that they're functioning well. And, yeah, like, you, you got to criticise Scotland in terms of, you know, their actual line-out and what they were trying to achieve off it. Um, because they, they kept throwing, throwing it to where Ireland were marking them up a lot of the time. They did try to change it. The first line-out in the second half, they tried to throw it to the tail. Like, and it just wasn't, just wasn't the right call. So... That's got to be looked at from a Scotland perspective. But just on Paul, one of, one of the biggest competitors that I ever played against. And I think he brings that competitive edge to his work ethic 
looking into coaching and you know that came out in buckets uh, against Scotland at the weekend. 